Before we begin, this video is going to be discussing particular story elements of the original Final Fantasy VII in heavy detail. With the remake having come out and people experiencing this story for the first time, there are going to be spoilers for later parts in the video. While the remake doesn't go up to this part in the story, consider yourself warned. Final Fantasy VII is considered not only one of the best games in the series, and not only one of the best RPGs ever made, but one of the best video games ever made. While there are certain parts of it that have aged not gracefully, it's remarkable how effective and powerful some elements of it still are and how poignant the story is, especially to today's world. The game earned its notoriety by exploring new themes, changing art styles and settings, and going for a more mature tone. In the move to 3D, Square had access to storytelling and directing tools that had been unavailable to them in previous games. In older titles in the series, everything in the game is framed in one camera angle. Aside from a couple of notable cutscenes, everything the player sees takes place in one perspective, with sprites moving and emoting on top of the backdrop. While these scenes can still be incredibly effective and memorable, the impact is different. These scenes feel more like watching a stage play or a puppet show than something like a movie, and Square wanted to evolve its storytelling to be more cinematic. Final Fantasy VII sought to take full advantage of its new capabilities, and while the limits of the PlayStation restricted them to have characters move across pre-rendered images, this still gave them a lot more freedom of movement and expression when it came to cinematography and camera work. The game changed from medieval fantasy settings to a more futuristic world that mashes many different influences together, from steampunk, cyberpunk, fantasy, and notably horror. The series has always dabbled in elements from these genres in the past, notably in science fiction and steampunk, but Final Fantasy VII fully embraced these and changed the face of the Final Fantasy series. These changes led to a lot of very memorable and iconic moments, but one of the most famous sequences in the entire game takes place in the beginning third or so of the story, the Nibelheim Incident. This scene stands out because its tone is incredibly unnerving and eerie, even for the rest of the game. It's the first scene in the game where you actually see Sephiroth and start to learn his motivations and character, as well as give us insight into Cloud and Tifa's relationship and who or what Genova is. It's incredibly well directed, and more than just being compelling, is one of the few examples of a horror scene in a Final Fantasy game. I wanted to talk about and dissect this scene and not only highlight standout moments, but also point out the more subtle elements that make this scene work so well. Before we start to go into detail into the individual moments of the scene, I wanted to talk about the thing I think really sells the atmosphere, the visual and art design. The atmosphere of the scene isn't one of explicit horror, but rather of unease. There's a lingering sense throughout the scene that something is off. While the story is being told fairly straight, there's something about the town, the way its people act, and the events taking place that just doesn't seem to make sense. The visuals of the town are bizarre, even for the standards of the rest of the game. The game already plays with proportion and clashing aesthetics throughout, but not quite as much as when you're in Nibelheim. The buildings all jut out at strange angles, mashing traditional-looking European architecture with alien accoutrements of steampunk attached to them. The mountains the town resides in don't look like the other mountains in the game, or like mountains at all. They're jagged, black, strange rock formations that look like something out of a bizarre dream. There isn't a lot written in interviews from the developers about the art direction and inspiration behind the visual design of the game, but a lot of this scene's aesthetics and the way characters act feels heavily inspired by the art movement known as Expressionism. Expressionism was an art movement in the beginning of the 20th century that originated from Germany, hence the often heard term German Expressionism. It uses contorted angles and shapes to create a distorted image of reality, often meaning to evoke the feeling of dreams. The art was meant to express a feeling, rather than perfectly depict a scene or an object. It was not only a movement in visual art, but also in film, with notable examples being The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, The Golem, and Nosferatu. These films use strange set design and camera angles to frame its characters in strange ways to evoke a particular feeling rather than photorealism. The original theatrical poster for The Golem has buildings that even look like the ones found in Nibelheim. Outside of Nibelheim, Midgar in particular borrows a lot from the 1927 film Metropolis, with the Tower of Babel being mirrored by the omnipresent Shinra building. Music also followed in this movement, with famous examples being operas like Wojek, which use dissonant chords and melodies, and the juxtaposition of joyous scenes against bloody, angry people to create a sense of unease. Similarly, the famous piece Rite of Spring by Stravinsky, while not exclusively expressionist, uses similar uncomfortable, non-traditional chords and melodies, as well as unconventional costume design for ballet. Nobuo Uematsu even cited this piece as a source of inspiration for him when he was composing the famous song One Winged Angel. The music in the scene also effectively sets the mood of a place that's familiar, but where things aren't quite right. The main theme of the town of Nibelheim, appropriately titled Anxious Heart, is a tense piece of music, but not without moments of reprieve. 
The opening eight measures of the song is in the key of C minor, yet the section of the song ends on the Picardy third of the key, C major. The Picardy third is a musical tool where the section ends on the major version of the root chord of a minor section. This strange use of the chord gives the piece a feeling of melancholy and grimness, but also a resolution of hope at the end. This is further shown in the rest of the piece, which continues to play its melody in the minor key. This is meant to be an occasion of homecoming for Cloud, who has come back to his hometown after joining Soldier. And yet the music gives a framing of something sinister lurking beneath, especially juxtaposed against Sephiroth asking Cloud if he's happy to be in his hometown. This section also ends on the same Picardy third and then moves into a section played on solo vibraphone switching to a major key. This section almost feels like a lullaby, with the soothing sound of vibraphone playing a simple calming melody. In the next section, the vibraphone plays the melody, but the song is transitioned back into a minor key. The lullaby and sense of ease the instrument gave is once again brought back into an atmosphere of foreboding. It gives the feeling that even though Cloud has come home, it isn't a happy occasion. This song plays throughout the majority of the time you're in Nibelheim. It frames the town as one of familiarity, but also with something under the surface. Something happened or is happening in it that isn't quite right. The song doesn't allow the player to feel quite at home. Similarly, the music that plays in the beginning of the scene and during the final section in the mansion, titled Those Chosen by the Planet, which also happens to be Sephiroth's theme, plays a single repeating note on chimes, under which the timpani plays a pulsating, heartbeat-like rhythm. The music is ominous and uncomfortable and makes the opening battle of the scene feel that much more tense. While it plays like a normal fight, you don't hear the typical battle music. You hear this uneasy, pulsating heartbeat. You're not meant to feel safe fighting next to someone so strong. You're meant to feel somewhat afraid. While Sephiroth in this moment is your ally, the gulf of power between him and Cloud is incredibly large. Up to this point, the game has already established that Sephiroth is the villain of the game, so while this doesn't reveal any new information about him, it helps to drive home just how truly powerful Sephiroth is compared to you. From here, I wanted to break down the scene and highlight especially effective moments that really sell the atmosphere, because it is, in my opinion, one of the best directed scenes in the entire series. From the first battle, you and Sephiroth enter the town, and Sephiroth asks Cloud how it feels to be back in his hometown again. When Cloud asks him about his own upbringing after, Sephiroth responds oddly. He talks about his mother, and then when his father is brought up, he laughs and waves it away, but there's something sinister to the laugh. There's ambiguity to it, and a sense that Sephiroth is clearly hiding something from Cloud and the player. When the player resumes control of Cloud, they're given a few options of places to go. One of the most interesting places you can go is Cloud's house, where we meet Cloud's mother. This section sets Cloud out to be what's called an unreliable narrator, a device that the whole Nibelheim sequence makes use of to give the impression that Cloud is either lying about the events or isn't remembering them properly. We'll come back to this later. Cloud's mother is vibrant and happy to see him, yet Cloud is heavily disconnected from the conversation, which is a noticeable difference to the energetic Cloud that was talking to Sephiroth earlier. In addition to this, the scene makes heavy use of jarring jump cuts. There isn't one coherent conversation happening, but instead snippets of multiple conversations that we never see in full. The scene also punctuates these cuts with a loud static sound and a flash on the screen. It's unnerving and illustrates Cloud's gaps in memory, or perhaps that Cloud is even making this event up just to please his party's curiosity. In fact, when you try to re-enter the house after the scene plays out, Cloud says he doesn't want to go back in. It leaves the player with a feeling of ambiguity and uncertainty. We're watching a reunion between mother and son, but the son is unengaged and we only see unconnected bits of conversation. From this point, Cloud has Sephiroth meet up with their guide, another main character and Cloud's childhood friend Tifa, who takes them through the jagged Nibelheim Mountains and to the reactor they were meant to investigate. One of the most visually striking rooms in this reactor is the room directly preceding Genova's room. This room is full of glowing pods and twisting tubes, all framed in a bright red light, giving an immediate sense of danger. Red is often used in film and other media as a warning or something to catch your attention. It's the reason why traffic signs meant to catch your eye or display warning are oftentimes red. It's the color of blood or poisonous fruits and animals. This room is dangerous and unsettling. Sephiroth has Cloud look inside the pods where they see grotesque monsters sitting in pools of Mako. Sephiroth tells us that they were once living beings that were being experimented on by Shinra, much like how members of Soldier are made, but taken to an even further extreme. 
This revelation causes Sephiroth's breaking point, and he lashes out against the pods and against the scientist that created them, Hojo, who later becomes one of the central antagonists of the game. During this is when one of the pods begins to open. This scene is probably the most stereotypical horror scene out of the whole sequence, but even then subverts some of the typical tropes of monster movies. The pod shakes and we see one of the Mako beasts scream against the glass, its lips black and its teeth gnarled. The pod begins to overload and breaks open, and instead of the monster getting up and fighting the player, it falls to the ground dead, unable to live outside of the Mako it bathed in. The monster is meant to be disturbing and alien, and you're meant to be afraid of it coming out of its pod, but it's framed in a way that makes you feel pity for it. It was once a living creature, just like Cloud and Sephiroth. It's a less obvious use of this kind of setup that makes the scene more impactful. This scene could have easily ended with another boss fight against a scary monster, but it wouldn't have been the same. The scene works because the true horror isn't the monster, but the actions that Shinra is willing to do to living creatures in pursuit of power. The monster is a victim more than a threat. When we fade back in from the FMV, Sephiroth has locked himself in the Shinra mansion, with the music playing the main theme of the game, but played this time in a minor key. The mansion serves as an important set piece for the rest of the game because it's within the mansion that the game sets up the madness that's stirring within Sephiroth. As Cloud enters the mansion, it appears to be a standard spooky haunted house, but the closer you get to Sephiroth, the camera angles become more and more angular and strange. The shot in particular of Cloud going down the walkway to the basement is a very powerful and unsettling one. It's shot at a straight down angle. Instead of showing you this from the same angle of the stairs in Don Corneo's mansion or the descent in Cosmo Canyon, this shot puts the focus of the camera on the spiral down to the basement. The walkway itself is haphazard and makeshift, and one that clearly hasn't been used in a long time. Even the first few planks of wood on the walkway aren't built at the same angle of the rest of the steps and are instead just placed on top of one another, similar to the shaky, precarious design of Blight Town. The shot is unnatural, and it draws the view straight down into an area that you can't see. You as the player can't tell what's at the end of the tunnel, yet you must continue to spiral towards it. As you enter the study, Sephiroth doesn't even notice your presence at first. As you walk deeper into the study after him, the hallway you run down is also framed at an awkward, unsettling 45 degree angle. It doesn't sit at the center of the frame, either vertically or horizontally, and this angle also perfectly frames Sephiroth's obsessive dive into the books of the study, poring over pages of reports, increasingly becoming more and more betrayed and confused at his own existence. That night, Cloud awakens in the Shinra mansion and goes into the basement to check on Sephiroth. What's particularly effective about the run-up to Sephiroth is that the game doesn't just place Cloud there or show a brief cutscene of him getting there, but instead makes the player move Cloud into the basement. The music from the beginning of the scene begins again, signifying something bad is about to happen, the beat of the music imitating Cloud's own beating heart. The player has to go into the study themselves. They know what's down there and have that much more time to wonder and dread about what's going to happen to them, their own heart sinking in beat with the pulsating music. In the study, Sephiroth speaks to Cloud about a lot of things, but talks to Cloud as if the two of them have a history together, even calling him a traitor. He gives exposition into the history of the world and who Genova is, yet Cloud is completely confused. He doesn't know why Sephiroth is calling him a traitor or why he's telling him all this information. This is punctuated by the even more confusing and ominous ending statement Sephiroth gives, I'm going to see my mother, at which point Sephiroth's full theme starts playing. The melody is evil sounding, and the build up prior to it makes this so much more powerful. The song builds a motif that you hear multiple times. You hear this motif at the beginning of the scene and in the run up to Sephiroth in the study, but only after Sephiroth has truly become a villain do you hear the full theme. As Cloud exits the mansion, he sees his hometown completely engulfed in flames. This leads to arguably the most iconic shot in the game, the FMV sequence of Sephiroth walking into the flames. This shot is so scary and memorable because Sephiroth is standing in the middle of a raging fire and simply looks up menacingly directly into the camera and then walks out of sight deeper into the blaze. Sephiroth stands in the middle of burning flames and yet is completely unaffected by them or at least doesn't notice them. The only thing he notices or cares about is Cloud, who he looks at with contempt and hatred in his eyes and then walks away. In this shot, he feels almost inhuman, like Sephiroth has become a force of nature. The man who was already several leagues above you has now become even more untouchable. Once back inside the reactor, we see the inside of Genova's chamber, which is a menacing and in some ways beautiful area. The room is completely black except for a single illuminated focal point, the Genova Effigy, which is a machine made in the image of an angel, but the image is unsettling. It has the face and wings of an angel, but coming out of the torso are long, winding tubes and other mechanical devices. Its face is eyeless and expressionless. 
This kind of combination of clashing imagery, especially with machinery, was used heavily in shows like Neon Genesis Evangelion and movies like Alien, especially in the artwork of H.R. Geiger, which this image seems to take inspiration from. It also obscures the image of Genova and the rest of the room. We don't see what's in the room aside from this one unsettling effigy. As Cloud approaches Sephiroth, another FMV plays of Sephiroth ripping the effigy out of place to reveal the true Genova. As Sephiroth talks to you, the camera views him from the front, but also from above. As he continues talking, he slowly raises his head and looks into the camera while extending his hand as if he's looking at and reaching towards the player. He reaches towards this unmoving figure, the look in his eye growing more intense and obsessive. The slow, deliberate actions of Sephiroth greatly grow the air of suspense. This culminates as Sephiroth grabs the effigy in the middle of the room and tears it out of the wall violently, throwing it aside. As the angel falls, the oil from the machine leaks from it, and part of it leaks out of its eyes, giving the appearance of the angel crying. While this is happening, the whole scene takes place still in complete blackness aside from the illuminated characters. Much like Cloud, the player can only watch in horror as this takes place, the only thing visible being the man you're meant to fear. The room illuminates and you see the true face of Genova, a humanoid-looking alien creature. The final part of this scene is the part that leaves a lot of people confused, and in my opinion is probably the most effective way the scene could have ended. Cloud draws his sword against Sephiroth, and all of a sudden the action stops. The shot cuts back and forth between Cloud and Sephiroth standing apart from each other, the cuts grow faster and faster, and then it fades to white. Cloud's memory ends here. The scene ends without a dramatic showdown between good and evil. Not only does it end without a fight, we don't even find out how it ends at all. He even states he doesn't understand how he could have made it out alive or why he doesn't remember any of it. The other party members seem just as confused. This ending makes the whole scene that much more effective. The entirety of the flashback, there are moments of confusion, distortion, and even parts where you feel like Cloud is lying. He then tells you that he faced off against the strongest man who ever lived, a man whose strength you witness firsthand in a playable sequence, lived, and can't tell you how he lived. I've seen a lot of people say that this confused them or that the game wasn't written properly, but the point of this ending is to have the player doubt Cloud. Earlier I mentioned Cloud was being established as an unreliable narrator. This gives you the impression that not only is Cloud an unreliable narrator for certain parts, but the entire story he told you could possibly not be trusted. And if his story can't be fully trusted, then maybe Cloud, the character you control for almost the whole game, also can't be fully trusted. The rest of your party also casts doubt on Cloud's story. Eris brings up that if Cloud's story were true, then Sephiroth would have stolen Genova from the reactor, and yet they all saw Genova at the Shinra HQ earlier in the game. Barrett says that he's more confused now than he was in the beginning. This story develops Cloud's character beyond just explaining his backstory. There's a deeper subtext to this whole event. We walk away from this with a nagging feeling that something isn't quite right with the main character. This scene is a masterclass in effective direction in a video game scene. In isolation, it tells a self-contained story with a beginning, middle, and end, giving main characters development and establishes the main motivation for the player to keep questing. We learn about Sephiroth, what caused him to turn down the path he did, what his motivations are, why we should be afraid of him, and why the party should go after him. This scene also perfectly sets up its own atmosphere and does an incredible job at using all the tools a video game and no other medium can use to effectively tell a story. From the art direction which takes inspiration from over a century's worth of art and film, to the music which works to give an air of dread and uncertainty, to the ability to have the audience participate in the events. The player gets to feel the dread of walking into the basement. They get to see through Cloud's eyes into the pod to see the horrific Mako beasts. This scene deploys a masterful use of suspense, world-building, and uncertainty of pacing to deliver one of the most iconic, impactful, and talked-about moments in not only this game, but the entire series.